Hello, my name is Rose Peters, and today I'd like to talk to you about some tips and tricks to performing the neurologic exam in small animal patients. Just a few learning objectives. Uh, today we're going to review the six main parts of the neurologic exam, and I would like you to understand the difference between level of mental state versus quality of mental state and what that might mean for where the problem is coming from in the nervous system. I'd like you to be able to identify the different parts of postural and gait abnormalities, to identify the afferent and efferent components to each cranial nerve test, understand the concept of the reflex arc in our leg reflexes, and to understand the difference between voluntary motor, withdrawal reflex, and deep pain sensation. So first, why do we need to get a good history and do that focused neurologic exam? Our first um, question really addresses, is this problem neurological or not? So we're going to see a lot of problems come to us that might seem like seizures or seem like paralysis or initially appear to be a neurologic problem, but on closer inspection, we discover that it's caused by something different. If we confirm there's a neurologic problem, then we need to identify where the problem is coming from in the nervous system or what we call the lesion localization. We break this up into a few different parts of the nervous system, the brain, the spinal cord, and the peripheral nerve and muscle system. We also might have to consider multifocal disease. So, Depending on where we localize our lesion, it determines what kinds of diseases we should consider and what kinds of tests we should do. We're also looking to answer what is the nature of this disease. Is it very urgent or do we have time to be able to take a slower approach? So no matter what we're addressing, whether it's a pet with gastrointestinal upset or an irritated eye or skin disease or certainly our neurologic problems, we're having to take things in a very systematic manner. So we're gonna assess our signalment. Do we have any clues from the dog's breed and age? Uh, we get a good detailed history. We perform a good general physical exam. And then we always in neurology cases wanna do that focused neurologic exam. So when we're looking at signalment, um, you know, if you're a very good doctor, you should be looking at your schedule ahead of time to be able to start preparing your mind for what you might see in those cases when they come in. Your schedule is going to be very busy. Usually you won't have much time allowed for each appointment, so it's good to be prepared. So if you're looking at the schedule, you look at Eliza, for example, you see that she's a Cavalier King Charles Spaniel and she's coming to you for neck pain and she won't stop scratching. You can already start having some guesses that maybe this cavalier has caudal occipital malformation syndrome because that's a very common neurologic condition in that breed that can cause exactly these signs. Or maybe Coco the wiener dog who can't stand up in the back legs is paralyzed because she has a herniated intervertebral disc one of the more common diseases that we can see in that breed. So already we might start to formulate some ideas about differentials just from seeing our signalment and some initial clues about history or at least that presenting complaint. So when we're getting more information from history, we should read any records that we have ahead of time. Um, you're gonna Try and make sure you know why that pet is coming to you and what your owner's main concern is. Don't overlook addressing those issues. And use open-ended questions. And really be aware that leading questions can sometimes take us off track. So if an owner tells you that they're giving a medicine that another veterinarian prescribed, that it starts with a P, don't say, is it prednisone? Because most owners will say yes, even if they're not sure that it's prednisone. And you might find out later from looking in the record that it was Prilosec, or maybe a different medicine that doesn't start with P at all. So, um, so think about these open-ended questions like, 
uh, tell me how your dog was behaving after the seizure ended at home. And that way they might tell you about um, symptoms of maybe blindness or agitation or um, being very clingy. And you can get a lot more and different information than if you were to just ask, um, was your pet acting clingy or sluggish right after the seizure? That only gives you very limited information as a, a response. So don't be, um, don't forget to ask about things like family history. So especially if we're worried about uh, younger animals, we might think about whether other litter mates are affected. Or if we're thinking about idiopathic epileptic cases, we want to find out if any other relatives also have a seizure condition to try and raise that index of suspicion for us. And in that particular animal, we want to know a, a lot of detail about the progress of signs the pet or the owners have seen at home, any previous or current diseases, um, any medicines or supplements they might be on, and the kind of food that they're eating at home. And you really have to be thoughtful of your tone, your body language, and your word choices, because this is the time where you're really trying to gain the trust and respect and cooperation of this client. Uh, and some people are quite sensitive and even a little bit of sense of irritation or impatience can really put someone uh, against you or uh, take a client who would have been a lifelong client and certainly a, a source of income for you in the long run and turning them to a different practice or a different doctor. So we are um, still a service industry, and that means that we have to offer not just our medical service, but we have to be very professional, polite, empathetic, and provide a very good and positive experience, not only for the pet, but also for this family. So that needs to be a big part of your history taking experience as well, is having a, a very good professional uh, and friendly um, and uh, empathetic demeanor. So this is the time that we should perform that very good detailed physical exam. At minimum, you should be getting like a TPR and a weight and sculpting the chest very well and having a good belly palpation. Uh, and depending on what you're worried about, if you have a pet with blindness as a presenting complaint, you may be doing a very detailed uh, eye exam as well. If you have vestibular disease, you may be having a very focused otic exam. If there's a limping or mobility issue, then an orthopedic exam may be part of this. But um, no matter what, don't forget to overlook those other systems when we're trying to figure out if this is neurological or not. So for the neuro exam, there are six main parts. And the first two parts are things that you can do just while you're in that history taking process. I like to tell owners to put animals on the floor so that they can um, let them walk around the room and explore a little bit. It gives me a quick idea of whether or not that pet can walk well or not. And if it can't, what kind of gait abnormality are we seeing? And it also gives me some clues about mental state and if they're interacting with the environment and, and me in a way that would be expected to be normal. And then the other four parts, looking at cranial nerves, postural reactions, reflexes, and palpation are all more of a hands-on experience. So when we're um, looking at this pet on the floor, I like to make sure I've got some non-slick flooring in the room. I like to unroll sheets of yoga mat. You can buy it in bulk online. And I like to keep a pretty calm demeanor in the room. I find the more calm that I am, the more calm the owner might be, and the pet also can become much more calm. Sometimes I'll even sit on the floor when I have a pet who's very anxious or nervous. And I find that if I sit on the floor while I chat with the owner and the pet's able to um, come up and investigate me a little bit, I find that also brings down the relative level of anxiety. 
You can also stock some small hypoallergenic treats. So if you don't need to fast this animal for any reason or be too worried about a, a couple of treats being ingested, um, then sometimes this also helps to win over those pets um, to you and help to make them much more cooperative. And always, always take notes. So it seems like it should be easy to remember everything that you're looking at, but especially on a busy day, if you're seeing 10 or 15 patients, it might be hard at the end of the day to remember, was this a right side, a left side? Um, was this the dog that had that trouble with blinking? Um, just always remember uh, to keep those notes with you. So when I look at a pet's mental state, I'm thinking of two uh, components to that mental state assessment. I think about the level of mentation, that's how awake or asleep is that pet. And then I think of the quality of mentation. So no matter how sleepy they might be or bright they might be, are they responding in an appropriate way in that circumstance? So for level of mental state, there are four main terms that we use. Um, three of them have relatively discrete definitions. So normal is, I think, pretty self-explanatory. We've got a pet who's behaving typically, who's nice and alert and responsive to you with no confusion or anything else strange. And the owners report that they're very normal at home. Nothing has changed. So I will skip ahead now to the other end of the spectrum with comatose. So coma has a very discreet definition. This is a pet who is unconscious and not responsive to even the most irritating stimulus. So you can pinch this dog's toe almost completely off and this is a pet who will not respond to you. So that is coma. Stuporous is a level below coma where this animal is rousable um, but does tend to fall asleep or is very sleepy when you're not handling the pet. And it requires you to do something annoying, like picking up and moving the animal around or pinching toes or being loud or in some way um, being irritating to try and stimulate a response. And so in that case, uh, we would have a stuporous animal who requires an irritating stimulus to respond to you. Obtunded is the one that has kind of the ill-defined definition. So this is the one that covers everything in between normal and stupor, and that is a big range. So I tend to break this down for myself into three separate categories. I think of a pet who's mildly obtunded as maybe one who looks normal to the outsider, and maybe to you it even looks normal. But when you talk to the owner, you find out that this pet is less active, sleeping more at home, not playing so much, and seems to be more subdued than normal. So we would consider that to be mentally altered, but in a very mild way. Moderately obtended to me would be a pet who is obviously quieter than they should be, um, but nowhere close to being that stuporous pet who's falling asleep in front of your eyes. And then severely obtunded is the pet who's, who's certainly um, very, very quiet, mentally altered, and is nearly to that point of falling asleep on the table, but just isn't quite there yet. So uh, when I think of then uh, that level of mentation, we're thinking about the reticular activating system or the RAS uh, it's also called the ARAS, and that's the Ascending Reticular Activating System. So it's all the same thing. This is the part of the brain through the brainstem and forebrain that helps us to be alert and awake and respond to our environment. So if you have problems in either the forebrain or the brain stem that affects that RAS system, then animals can be sleepier than they should be. So um, we can also have changes in the quality of mental state. So no matter how awake or asleep they are, they might be behaving strangely for the circumstance. So this is um, what we would consider dementia, or if you see confusion, 
Or even if you're not seeing confusion as much as a personality change, like a cat who used to be aggressive, who is now snuggly, or a snuggly cat who is now aggressive. Um, these are all things that can fit under changes in that quality of mental state. So this is more specific to the forebrain or the cerebrothalamic part of the brain. That's all the same thing. So if we see a change in quality of mental state, especially confusion and dementia and behavior changes that should all make us think about forebrain. And again, we remember we asked the owners if there's any changes from normal at home because those more subtle signs aren't always obvious to us in the exam room. So with mental state, we can look at this example of a dog who under normal circumstances is very energetic engaged, would be exploring the room, coming over, wagging his tail to say hello to you. Um, but in the last couple of weeks, he's been very subdued. So there's a change in his level of mental state because he's been quieter than normal. But in addition to that, we see some signs of confusion. So we see him getting caught in corners and not being really sure how to get out of that corner and just seeming like he's got a little bit of dementia as well as that obtundation. So if we're seeing this kind of behavior, getting lost in corners like this, we start thinking about forebrain disease. So this is a mixture of changes of level of mentation as well as changes in quality of mentation. So this is the time we're also looking at his posture and gait in the room. And we're asking ourselves, is this pet ambulatory? And if we are, um, do we have any limping or weakness or incoordination? And if we aren't able to walk, is it the back legs or is it all four legs that we're having trouble with? Or are there signs of brain disease in our body posture or trouble being able to move? So just to go through some of these abnormal postures, um, one is the head tilt. So with a head tilt, the pet may still be looking straight ahead at you, but the head is tilted down towards the ground to either the right or the left side. And this is a cardinal sign of vestibular disease. So with a vestibular head tilt, then we have to ask next, is the problem peripheral, meaning it's coming from that vestibulocochlear nerve or ear structures, or is it central, coming from inside the brain that that nerve talks to? So in most circumstances, we'll have a head tilt to the same side as the lesion or the problem inside the nervous system, but sometimes we might have something called paradoxical vestibular or paradoxical um, syndrome where the head tilt might be to the opposite side. So at the very least, we know a head tilt tells us there is vestibular disease, and then we have to try and figure out what type of vestibular disease it is with some more information. So in contrast to a head tilt, we can have a head turn. This is where the head is turned now to look over the shoulder to the right or left side. And this is a sign of forebrain disease or that cerebrothalamic part of the brain. This will always be on the same side as the lesion. So when we have a pet who walks in circles, we know that either a vestibular or a forebrain lesion can cause that walking in circles behavior. It's going to be the head tilt or the head turn that tells us is this circling coming from a vestibular problem with the tilt or is it coming from maybe a forebrain problem if there is a head turn. And some animals might have more of a head and body turn, so they're curved around almost in the little C shape we call that pleuris thoughtness. That's a long fancy word that we don't expect you to probably use out in practice. You can tell us that there is a head and body turn. I'm just making you aware of the formal terminology for that position. 
So the four brain diseases, when we do have that head and body turn, that's always to that same side. And every once in a while, this comes with some other weird behaviors, like turning all the way around to a sound um, to that direction, or only eating food on that side of the bowl as well, because they're turning towards a part of the world that they can see and sense very well. And in this disease, they have trouble seeing and sensing the other side. So that's why we can sometimes see this weird stuff is because they can't sense that other half of the food bowl. We can have changes in our um, general body posture or trunk posture. So most commonly we'll see a dorsal curvature or a kyphosis, but we can also see this sway back or what we call a lordosis. We can have scoliosis, that's a lateral curvature. You can think about the spine being shaped like the S of scoliosis. Torticollis is where not only is the head and neck lifted upwards, but it's also twisted. Or we can have opisthotness, which is a simple dorsal extension of the head and neck. We might also appreciate that it's often easy to see when animals have pain in the neck part of their spine just from watching the way that they stand and the way that they move around. So you can see um, this dog on the top it has an arched back, that kyphosis. The head and neck is also very low to the ground. So this was a dog who didn't want to lift her chin at all. She walked and stood in that posture all the time. And this poor little beagle down here you see also doesn't really want to flex and move the head and neck around very much. This beagle is moving really the head and neck with the whole body really stiff and straight and tends to look up at you with the eyeballs instead of trying to lift the head and neck up to, to look at you. So if you're seeing these signs, you should already start to wonder if this is a pet who has neck pain. We can have um, resting abnormal body postures. So this is a very serious form of abnormal body posture called decerebrate rigidity. This is essentially a circumstance in which the inputs and outputs um, from the body to the forebrain and vice versa can no longer communicate well together. And it indicates a serious injury to the front part of the brainstem called the midbrain. And this area is responsible also for our pupil function and for our level of awareness because that RAS system goes right through that part of the brainstem. So animals can have this opisthotness or the extended head and neck can have stiff and straight um, front legs and back legs. And these animals are usually very, very dull or in a coma and may have trouble with normal pupil function. We compare this to decerebellate rigidity, which is a problem inside the cerebellum. And when we have a problem in the cerebellum, if it's only in the cerebellum, we should have a pretty normal mental state. We'll still have this opisthotness. And now the front legs are also flexed or extended outwards but the back legs are now flexed up towards the body instead of extended out and straight. So it depends on the kind of lesion. If there's a problem that does also affect the brain stem, which sits right next to the cerebellum, sometimes there can be changes in mental state uh, and that level of awareness. And uh, we might also see some weakness or trouble with strength in the legs. But in the purest sense, you can have a decerebellate posture from just a cerebellum problem. And that should not affect the mental state at all because the cerebellum is not involved with that ARAS system or personality and learning and, and other things that affect mentation. So if you look at decerebellate posture, it's actually quite similar in a photograph 
to the shift Sherrington posture. If you just showed me two photos, I would not be able to tell the difference. I would need to know the rest of your neurologic exam to be able to know which is which. Shift Sherrington posture comes from an injury to the thoracolumbar spinal cord, so right in the middle of the back, usually in the cranial lumbar spinal cord is where this happens. And this is affecting the deep or inner part of the spinal cord. So it can come from either a problem inside the spinal cord, like a stroke-like event, or it can come from a very severe problem coming from the outside in, like a very severe disc herniation. So in these cases, the pet will still have office thoughtness or stretching up of the head and neck. The front legs will be stiff and straightforward, but the back legs are very loose and often paralyzed. So they don't have the actively tucked up against the body tone that we see with um, decerebellate posture. Um, they're just going to be loose and limp. And then if we were to sling this dog up into a standing position, now the extension of the front legs and neck should relax and be less severe. And this dog can walk and look practically normal in the front end and then the back end um, usually is paralyzed or very, very weak in the sling. So that's the difference between the two. So when we're uh, thinking about prognosis, this shift Sherrington um, doesn't offer us a prognosis. It just tells us where the problem is coming from. So when we look back then at uh, our feet and our standing posture and tail carriage, we can see um, in this video, we've got maybe a mildly low um, stance in our hawks. We would call that a very mild plantigrade stance, but we're seeing a very limp and loose tail tone. So that tail carriage is very loose. And in this case, we also see there's no anal tone. So we know that we've got a problem affecting the nerve function to that tail and anus. And in this case, this is in the lumbosacral segment. We can see um, with the limbs in that plantigrade versus palmigrade stance, I've just indicated two other pictures here that are much more severe examples. So plantigrade can be as bad as practically walking on your hocks here, um, or palmigrade that you're walking on the wrists or the carpal joints. So it doesn't have to be this severe. I call these severe, but you can certainly be ranged in between from mild to that severe. So beyond stance, as we're watching the animal walk around the room, we're going to think about um, three main categories of abnormal movement. So one is lameness or limping, weakness or trouble with strength, and ataxia or trouble with coordination. So limping is usually an issue we see with orthopedic disease, often associated with a painful problem of the joint, um, muscle, soft tissues. But the exception to that can be when we're dealing with what's called a nerve root signature or a nerve-induced limping. So in this case, we can have an animal who's got some rubbing or irritation up against a nerve root. And what we know in humans is that those feelings can cause um, very uncomfortable sensations, sometimes burning or tingling, pinpricks, sometimes even stabbing and shooting pains uh, can come from that kind of nerve root irritation and bearing weight or putting that limb into a certain posture might further stretch or pinch that nerve to make those sensations more prominent. So we can sometimes see limping trying to relieve those sensations or carrying up the leg. Um, sometimes as they get those sharp shooting pains, they might even lift up and scream while holding up that leg. It can be quite um, unsettling for owners. So when we think about just limping as an observation, we usually break it up into four grades. So one is barely noticeable. Two is a clear and consistent limp, but that animal is bearing weight and otherwise walking well. 
Three is a pet whose limping is very severe with a lot of toe touching, but they're still able to bear some weight. And then four is a totally not weight bearing lameness. So when we're um, thinking about uh, what this can look like, we can have an animal who um, not only might have a limping, but we might see that there's some muscle wasting reduced reflex strength and quality. Um, things like withdrawal might be very weak. Sometimes we'll see knuckling of the foot. So if we're seeing some of these neurologic clues, and if our orthopedic exam is very boring with no bone or joint pain, then we should start thinking about a neurologic or nerve root signature induced limping. So we can have a weakness and an upper motor neuron weakness we term paresis and this can be uh, essentially a delay in the onset of protraction or the swing phase of the gait so you can see how this dog kind of leans forward and it takes a second or two for the legs to kind of catch up and start moving that's what we mean by that delay in protraction and in this dog, we'll see sometimes that right front foot just kind of knuckled over a little bit as we tried to take a little step. So you might see that knuckling and scraping of the toes and nails. That's proprioceptive ataxia that we're noticing here. And what we also notice in this dog is the neck looks quite rigid and tense. Um, this is a dog who also has some neck pain and he's reluctant to move his head and neck around in a fluid way. He has unfortunately a tumor at C23 that's smushing his spinal cord to cause pain and also some weakness and proprioceptive ataxia in all four legs. We compare that to this dog who is a young Rottweiler about two years old who has, as you can see, a very loose and floppy gait. He's too weak to be able to walk on the slick floors without splaying out and needs a little help to get outside. And we can see that instead of having the big, meaty, robust muscles that a normal Rottweiler should have, he's got very lean muscling and this very floppy tone. So when we see this, we should think about a lower motor neuron weakness and especially with this floppy, floppy way of moving his legs, uh, we think about a generalized nerve disease or polyneuropathy. And this Rottweiler had a heritable um, degenerative neuropathy causing his gait and stride. These animals are also um, usually exercise intolerant, meaning they get tired and winded pretty easily. So just a little terminology for weakness, we think of paresis as a term just to describe decreased strength, but there's still the ability for that animal to move their legs a little bit. So it just means they can move their legs, but it's weaker than normal. And this can range everywhere from a dog who just has a little trouble jumping up on the couch, but is otherwise walking around okay to an animal who cannot stand up in the back legs and is barely moving those back legs, maybe a slight shuffle when you're asking them to try to move across the floor. Paralysis or plegia means there's no voluntary motor at all, that that limb or limbs are paralyzed. So we don't get this confused with the movement of a reflex so reflexes are when we do that little knee banger reflex for the patellar reflex, or if we're pinching the toes for a withdrawal to pull the foot away during withdrawal. Those are not the same as voluntary motor. So an animal can be totally paralyzed and still be able to pull their feet away or still have those reflexes intact. It's a uh, depends on whether these animals have what we call an upper motor neuron or a lower motor neuron lesion in terms of whether the reflexes are intact or not. So motor function tells us how bad a lesion is. Reflexes tell us where in the nervous system a lesion is. So we ask ourselves, is an animal able to walk? Yes or no. And if they have trouble walking, is it 
back legs or is it front and back legs? And we also ask, is it um, just on one side of the body or what we call a hemiparesis, like the front and rear limb on that same side is affected? Is it tetraparesis, all four legs, or is it monoparesis, just one limb? You can also have a diparesis, which is just the front legs, but that's very unusual. The degree of involvement is if we're slightly paretic, mild or moderately paretic, or severely paretic just before we're fully paralyzed. So ataxia has three main types. We think about vestibular ataxia, cerebellar ataxia, and proprioceptive ataxia. And all of these can describe in coordination of the body, limbs, and head. So with vestibular ataxia, um, probably our biggest clue is a head tilt. So if you see that head tilt, you already know there's a vestibular component to this ataxia. But we can also see this wide base stance and we can see a real uh, difficulty moving in a straight line and a tendency to lean and drift towards that same side of the head tilt. So if we're seeing that leaning and drifting, we should start looking for that head tilt and thinking about vestibular disease. So cerebellar ataxia, um, we think about as having an inability to give smooth, regulated movement to the body, limbs, and head. So that's the cerebellum's normal job is to help us move smoothly in a nice coordinated fashion through space. And if the cerebellum is injured, our movements become very exaggerated and spastic. So we think about hypermetria as being a feature of this with high steps and very exaggerated movements during our hopping tests. We can think about also seeing head tremors and something called an intention tremor, meaning the more excited we are and the more focused we are on something, the worse that tremor is. And when we're asleep and resting, that tremor goes away. So there's not much in the nervous system to cause that intention tremor other than a cerebellar lesion. So this is an example of um, pretty severe hypermetria that we can see. So this dog has a problem on the right side of its cerebellum and it's causing a very exaggerated way of moving the body on the right side. So you see these very exaggerated high steps. And the dog also has a wobble and sway, what we call a titubation to its body. And we look at little Bobbles here, who also has some of that wobble and sway and titubation, but we've got a general body tremor that gets to be more pronounced the more excited he gets or the more he's focused on doing a task or moving around. So he gets to see more shaky, more wobbly, more bouncy. So if you see a pet that has this kind of exaggerated wobble and bounce, you're already going to be thinking about a problem in the cerebellum. And then finally, we can have a proprioceptive ataxia. So just like that boxer that we saw, that white boxer in one of the first videos, um, this dog is going to have that delayed um, protraction. You see it especially in these back legs and is generally uncoordinated, kind of drunk looking in the way that she walks. And what's also unique in this case is this dog has something called a two engine gait. So this means the front legs are short and choppy and the back legs are really long and sloppy. It looks like you took one half of one dog and glued it onto half of another dog because the two ways of walking are so different in the same pet. And this is also a localizing sign. So it tells us there's a problem in the caudal cervical area or the C6 to T2 area of the spinal cord. So when we move up to the cranial nerves, um, we have 12 cranial nerves. And while we could test them one at a time, I prefer to do regional testing because it's quicker and it gives us several ways to test 
sometimes the same nerve in fast fashion. So if the test result is normal, then you know the nerve also should be normal. And if it's abnormal, you can look into a couple of other tests or ways of looking at that nerve dysfunction to be able to figure out if it's actually abnormal or not. So when I do regional testing, I look at the pet, I listen to them breathe, I feel the shape and symmetry of their head and face. And then I do menace, palpebrals and face sensation, PLRs, physiologic nystagmus and looking for positional strabismus, intranasal sensation, and then I look at jaw tone, looking at the tongue and how they gag. So just when we're observing, you know, you can look for all kinds of different things. So this first cat we can see has a nisocoria or an asymmetry of the pupils. So that already gets us thinking about the things that can cause a nisocoria. This is a dog that has what we call a dropped jaw. It means this dog is physically unable to close the mouth and the mouth tends to hang open. So we start to think, should we look for a jaw fracture, a jaw dislocation, or do we have both trigeminal nerves not functioning well and they're very weak? So we need to start looking for maybe some sensory deficits to support a trigeminal neuritis or neuropathy. We can have animals who might have a head tilt and as we lift their nose towards the ceiling, this positional ventral or ventral lateral strabismus that we call a vestibular strabismus, so that confirms vestibular disease. We can look at this other little guy here. We see he's got muscle asymmetry, has a lot of muscle wasting and a droopy ear. So this tells us the muscle wasting part about trigeminal disease. But this droopy eyelid and droopy ear also tells us about facial nerve disease. So we're not even putting our hands on these pets and we're already getting ideas about what is going on in their nervous system. And this dog has a lot of nose discharge and eye discharge to make us think more about an infectious disease process that might be causing his neurologic signs. And then this scary little kitten with this very domed head is already making us worry about a very severe form of hydrocephalus. And then this little Boston is actually normal. So uh, all the genetics that we have um, really reinforced in these breeds to make these very cute round puppy like little heads also can affect the shape of the orbit that their eyeball sits in. And these animals can be prone to having this divergent strabismus, even if they're otherwise very healthy and normal. So if you have a pet who comes into you just for vaccines and they have this divergent strabismus and they otherwise have no complaints or other neurologic deficits, it's probably just something to watch instead of something to panic over. So our first cranial nerve is the olfactory nerve. I just include this as an example of showing you how we might test for whether or not it's working. We want to make sure that their nose is able to smell a, a tasty, smelly treat. You should not use alcohol or chemical odorants around the nose because that's actually going to stimulate the trigeminal nerve and not the olfactory nerve. But, you know, this is so rarely a presenting complaint or big issue that I don't really ever worry about testing for it. This is here just so you can understand how you might think about testing for it. So one of my first big tests is the menace response. And we call this a response because it's a learned behavior. It's not a hardwired reflex. So this requires animals to learn that they must protect their eye from something that's menacing or could be damaging. This requires an animal to see or the sensory input from your optic nerve, and it requires the ability to blink, which is through your facial nerve or cranial nerve seven. And then in between the forebrain, the cerebellum and the brainstem all also have to be intact uh, in this pathway for it to work. So you want to make sure you're not making too much noise so you don't hear you coming. You're trying to test vision and not hearing. 
You don't want to touch the whiskers accidentally with your fingers because you're wanting to test vision and not their face sensation in this test. And some animals who are very scared or like Daisy's very brave and trusting because she knows I'm not going to hurt her. Sometimes you just have to pat gently over the eyes to warn her and tell her that you're going to want to do this menace test. And then they're more likely to blink if they're going to. So with PLRs, this is another way to test the visual system. So that optic nerve helps to get the information into the nervous system. The efferent or motor part is your oculomotor or cranial nerve three. That's what helps to constrict the pupil. So what you wanna look at is from a distance, are the pupils nice and symmetric? And then you're gonna zoom in on one pupil at a time. You're gonna look closely and see the eye constrict, and you'll dance over and have a look at the other eye to make sure it also constricted. Likewise, you're gonna zoom in on that other eye and then bounce over to make sure they both constricted okay. So when you bounce over to the other side, you're looking for the consensual response. Both eyes should constrict at the same time when you shine a light into one eye. Animals who are very nervous or scared um, can have a lot of sympathetic tone that's going to override sometimes a weak pen light. So you can use a very bright LED light and usually any animal who's able to constrict will constrict with that very bright LED light. It's very annoying. I then test for palpebrals and face sensation. So I'll usually tickle around the eye, the base of the ear and the muzzle. And just seeing her blink and lick and twitch her whiskers a bit, that tells me that she can feel those things. Um, they don't often do those kinds of things when I just tickle the chin. So I do give the chin just a little pinch to see them trying to draw their lip away or pull their head away from me and tell me that they can feel it. So um, probably the most obvious sign when we have a problem is when we have an animal who cannot blink or close their eyelid with this test. Physiologic nystagmus or doll's eye um, is where we're testing to make sure we have that normal back and forth eyeball movement as we move that head around. I'll lift the eyelid so that I can see the whites of the eyes and see the eyes bounce back and forth. Um, animals who have a problem with this, if there's no physiologic nystagmus, there is either a brainstem lesion, that's the median longitudinal fasciculus, or the MLF that coordinates this response in the brainstem, or we can have bilateral vestibular disease that also can sometimes take away this reflex. And then you'll see other signs of that disease when we have that problem. So the input comes from the vestibular system or the vestibulocochlear nerve. And then the motor part are the nerves that help to innervate the eye. So that is cranial nerves three, four, and six, or the oculomotor, trochlear, and abducens nerves. Now we can also look for a resting and positional strabismus. So you can see on these pictures here on the right, as we lift these dogs' little noses up, we have an eyeball that drops or drifts down. So that's our vestibular or positional strabismus. Corneal reflex testing is not a test that I do routinely, but if I need to look more closely at um, eye function and I want to test sensation or the ability to retropulse that eye, this might be a test that I do. So the sensory part comes from the trigeminal nerve, and then the motor part comes from two things. So one, this pet will usually blink, so that is the facial nerve part. The other is a retropulsion or drawing the eyeball back in the eye socket, which also facilitates that blinking even more. And that is the abducens nerve. So when we're using this test, I like to use a saline soaked cotton tipped applicator so that it's relatively gentle to touch the eye. And you should always be very gentle because touching the cornea is very irritating. 
So you'll be able to see that this dog has a lot of muscle wasting on one side from trigeminal nerve disease. So we have a reasonable expectation that this eye might be too numb to have this corneal reflex be able to be normal on that side. And the other side of the head is normal. So you'll be able to see what a normal corneal reflex response should look like. So we touch the eye and the dog is unconcerned because it's very numb on that eyeball. Whereas the other eye, we have a good retropulsion of the eye and a good blink like we should have. So another test that we'll often do um, to test sensation and awareness is this intranasal sensation. So we'll close or block the eye so they can't see us coming and we'll just gently tickle the inside of each nostril. And a normal pet should be like Daisy here where it's very annoying and they want to try and pull away from you. Animals who have um, trigeminal nerve disease will have such a numb nostril that they won't feel what you're doing. And you can put that little hemostat in there quite far. And by quite far, I just mean maybe a couple of centimeters. You should never poke very far but um, much more than you ever would in a dog who can feel. And so that would be a pet who doesn't even really twitch their nose or respond to you as you input that little hemostat. We often will see in animals who have intact trigeminal nerve, but they have forebrain disease that's affecting their response or their behavior with us poking this thing up their nose that maybe they do twitch that nose a little bit because that hardwired um, twitch reflex with the trigeminal nerve and the um, probably facial nerve are there, but the behavioral component really isn't there. So they don't really care very much that you're sticking that little hemostat up in their nose. And it's most obvious when we have a lateralized forebrain lesion because you can see one side, they're obviously irritated and annoyed. And then the other side, they just twitch a little and don't care as much. We'll have a good look in their mouth to look at their tongue symmetry, jaw tone. And then in dogs that we trust or we're not worried about getting bitten by, sometimes you can even put your finger in their mouth to feel a good robust gag with your finger against their epiglottis. But animals you're worried about getting bitten by, you can massage their larynx and then try and elicit a good swallow moving past your fingers. I'd say that's less reliable even in normal pets, but it's much safer than putting your hand inside their mouth. So it takes a fair amount of time to talk about all these cranial nerves, but it really doesn't have to take much time to actually do the testing to look for problems in the cranial nerve. So when I'm in the exam room and going through my neurologic exam, the cranial nerve part really only takes um, a minute or certainly less than two minutes when I look at the whole thing. So we're already here almost done with this entire cranial nerve exam. I'm just from this short description here. And then just a reminder to not forget to do your fundic exam to look for signs of other causes of blindness or systemic diseases that might be related to the presenting complaint. So as we move out of the brain, we're going to start thinking about spinal function testing. And we think about uh, looking at a few different things. So we're looking at observation of the gait and posture that already gives us a lot of clues about where in the spine the problem might be coming from, depending on which legs are affected and how the legs move in the swing phase of the gait. We think about proprioceptive testing myotatic reflexes, the skin reflex or that cutaneous trunky, perineal reflex or that anal reflex, and palpation of the pet. So postural reactions, we're essentially looking for long track signs. This is very nonspecific. 
So it just tells us there's some problem with that pet's ability to know where its foot is in space. And it can be a problem anywhere along the nerve in that leg, the entire spinal cord, the brain stem, or the forebrain. So it's pretty much everywhere except for the muscle and the cerebellum. So it's very nonspecific. It just tells us that this is probably a neurologic disease if we have poor proprioception. Then we need to take the other clues from our exam to try and tell us where in the nervous system the problem is coming from. So when I'm testing proprioception, I'll do three main types. I like to do foot placing, hopping, and wheelbarrow and natural cross extensor type stepping. So for foot placement, I like to make sure that the pet's weight is supported. So she shouldn't be like flying off the ground like this, but she also should feel supported enough where she's not gonna fall if you pick up a leg. You're gonna turn her foot over, make sure she's not actively pulling away from you, and then release the foot and she should want to turn that foot right back over again within a second or two. She should not be wiggling and she should be nice and square. So her front legs are under her shoulders and her back legs are under her hips. So Daisy is very normal with her proprioception. And we're going to compare this to an abnormal pet. So it looks like proprioception is normal in the right foot but as we turn the left foot over, it stays knuckled over. So that's abnormal proprioception or conscious proprioception or CP deficit. Likewise, you even see that front leg knuckling over again while we're trying to test these other feet. So this is a pet who has a right head turn and has left weakness and paresis and CP deficits and also came to us for seizures. So this is a very um, typical presentation for a right-sided forebrain lesion. So another test of proprioception is hopping. And with hopping, you can do this on the table or on the floor. With smaller pets, I like to do this up on the table. And you need to have a nice non-slick surface. So I like to use yoga mats or, or other grippy pads on the table. And you're going to want to push the pet uh, so that they're falling away from you. They need to have this sense that they need to catch themselves to keep themselves from falling. So it gives them this sense that there's no security and that nobody's going to catch them and they need to move their leg to catch their balance. If you do this test incorrectly where you're pulling the pet towards you, you know, unconsciously, I think they can have a false sense of security where they feel like they're being carried instead of being thrown off balance. Then they don't usually try very hard. So even a normal pet might not have good hopping if you're doing the test wrong. So I just want to show in Daisy how to do it the right way and how it looks doing the wrong way so that you know even in a normal pet, you might get the wrong response if we're not doing things right. So it's important to know how to do the test correctly to be able to get good results. So we're gonna test one foot at a time and you can see I'm pushing her away from me. So there's nobody there to catch her. She has to catch herself. So she's got a nice brisk way of stepping and replacing her foot. That's what we wanna see. That's nice normal hopping behavior. So we're gonna compare that now to if I just carry her towards me, see how she kind of drags that foot and doesn't try very hard to hop. It's not as brisk and defined and barely even tries with this other foot. So we can see normal when we do it the right way, abnormal when we do it the wrong way. So we need to always remember before we assess if this is abnormal, if we're doing the test correctly. Wheelbarrow is a little easier. We're just gonna lift up the back legs and push the pet forward. And we wanna see nice brisk stepping in those front legs. And we're looking for the ability to take those steps. Any asymmetry is one side weaker and slower than the other. Um, and if you wanna try and highlight subtle problems, you can even lift their chin up towards the ceiling and push them forward. And that can exaggerate things that are much more um, mild and subtle to see. Extensor postural thrust is a great test to use for wiggly little dogs and cats. 
where we can pick them up, make sure their feet engage with the ground, and then smoothly swing them backwards for this stepping motion. You want to see rhythmic stepping that's symmetrical in both feet. And again, we're looking, can they step? And if they are, are they nice and symmetric or is one weaker and slower than the other? So for segmental reflexes, ideally, I like to have a pet laying down with a good restrainer for these. This gives me the most accurate results for reflex testing and gives me an opportunity to get a good orthopedic exam at the same time. So even before you lay them down for this test, you've had a chance to watch them move around the room and you should have a good idea of whether their reflexes should be normal or not. So any pet who can bear good weight and carry and pick up their legs in that swing phase should have normal extension and normal flexion. If they have poor extensor tone, they're going to have a lot of trouble bearing weight and might collapse down into the stepping part of the gait. If they have trouble with um, flexor function, they're going to have trouble picking up the leg in the swing phase of the gait and might look like they're shuffling and not taking normal steps. So when I think about front legs and back legs, I'm breaking things up into flexor reflexes like the biceps and withdrawal or the gastroc and cranial tibial and withdrawal or extensor function like the triceps and the patellar. And then we always remember just to check the anus and the cutaneous trunk eye reflexes as well. So for all these reflexes, these are essentially um, stretch reflexes. So it requires the muscle and tendon to be stretched and tight to get a good brisk response. If the muscle and tendon are too loose, you'll either get a very weak response or no response. So it can make it seem like the reflex is absent. So this is another circumstance where doing the test the right way helps you um, to know whether a problem is truly abnormal or not. So before you assume reflexes are absent, ask yourself if you're doing the test correctly. So the most accurate reflexes are going to be withdrawal in both front and back legs and the patellar reflex in the back leg. But I'm gonna show you all of these reflexes so you have an idea of how we look at them because they are looking at different things, extensor and flexor function. So biceps will test for flexor function. The biceps um, reflex is mediated by the musculocutaneous nerve that comes from the C6 to T2 part of the spinal cord. So a problem in the nerve or that C6 to T2 part of the spinal cord can cause a trouble with this reflex. What we want to do is pull the elbow backwards to stretch that muscle and tendon. And I have my thumb uh, in this circumstance on the tendon itself, so I can feel it just in the medial part of that elbow. And then I'm gonna hit my thumb with the hammer and I should have a contraction of the entire biceps muscle. So you can see in the video how her leg will kind of jump. You might even appreciate that muscle contraction in the biceps area a little bit that I indicate with the reflex hammer. And if you're doing this, you're going to feel that jump of the leg under your hands. So let me see. We're going to go back and then I'll let that play for you. All right. So we see I have my hand, my thumb on that tendon. I give that a hit. And then the muscle is contracting there just under her harness and causing her legs to kind of jump. So you see it's much less vigorous if there's not the stretch compared to when I do stretch and I have a much more vigorous and good reflex. So with the triceps reflex, similarly, we want some good stretch. So I'm going to make sure the elbow is bent. You might even pull the elbow up towards the ceiling a bit, just like this, to get even more stretch. And then you're going to hit across that tendon. And when you do, um, it's hard to see in this video, but the triceps muscles are contracting. And you'll feel the leg kind of jump under your hands as well. 
And then when we do withdraw, you're gonna tickle or lightly pinch their toes. Daisy's very dramatic here. I'm not pinching her very hard, but you're seeing two important things that we can test with this. So one is the simple ability to pull the leg up towards the body. So that tells us that that um, biceps uh, reflex, that musculocutaneous nerve is working well. It tells us that the spinal cord segments in the C6 to T2 part of the spinal cord are working well. So that's the reflex arc are those parts, the, the muscle, the nerve, and that spinal cord part just right over the shoulders. So if the reflex arc is working, the reflex also works. But what we also see is a behavioral response. So Daisy, with her looking back and whining a little, tells me she's super annoyed that I'm giving her a little toe pinch. And so she's consciously able to feel this withdrawal. So when we talk about nociception and the conscious ability to feel pain, I don't have to test deep pain in Daisy in this leg anymore because she's already told me that even with a light pinch, she can feel it just fine. But if she has no reaction and no response, and this is a paralyzed leg, then I'd have to give her a mean little pinch so that I can see if she can tell me if she can feel it or if she's just totally paralyzed and unable to feel in the worst sense of that injury. So for patellar reflex, just like the front end, we want to have a good um, stretch to that tendon apparatus. So we're going to flex the leg and we're going to try and have it at about a 90 degree angle. And animals who are very tense um, will sometimes override your efforts here. So you'll see Daisy, I kind of have to wait and have her relax a little bit. And then you'll see that tendon kick becomes much better just as she relaxes. So this tests the extensor function in the back leg. It's the femoral nerve that helps the patellar reflex. And that femoral nerve comes from the L4 to L6 segment specifically, but it's in that L4 to S2 or 3 intumescence area. Go where you're going. And I apologize that we have that volume on here. Usually these are limited. As she relaxes, she's going to start to get better kicks, like right there. So if the kick is intact at all, um, even sporadically as you're doing this test, then it is intact. Um, if you just can't get it at all, then there's a chance it could be actually absent. So with cranial tibial testing, this is a branch of the sciatic nerve. and This is going to test how well she can lift her little foot up at the hock. So I'll usually feel the muscle belly of the cranial tibial muscle. I'll feel the top of the tibia and kind of work down in a little V. And in the middle of that muscle belly, you can hit with the pointy end of the hammer and you should get this good brisk jump. So that's testing sciatic, which is also in that L7 to S3 um, segment area of the spinal cord. And then the gastroc also tests the sciatic, and this is going to be the caudal branch where it branches around the knee to make sure those gastroc muscles work so that they can stand up high in the hock. So I'll feel the middle of the muscle belly of the gastroc just below the knee and give that a little whack with the hammer, and you should also be able to see a good brisk foot flip. But one of the best tests for sciatic is just that little pinch to get a good withdrawal. So that helps to lift at the heel and pull up at the knee. And that, um, in this case, we also have Daisy telling us that she feels it consciously. You might see she's whining a little bit as I, I pinch her little toes. So we always have to remember that withdrawal is not the same as having deep pain sensation and not the same as voluntary motor. So this is a pet with a very severe T3 to L3 or middle back myelopathy who has shift Sherrington posture 
who's totally paralyzed in the back leg. So if we asked her to try to walk, she's just dragging them. They're very limp noodles. But when we do these reflexes, she has patellar reflex, she has withdrawal reflex. So those movements of the reflex are still there, but that's not voluntary. She can't help herself. And then we're pinching very meanly with these hemostats and she's not reacting. So that tells us she has absent nociception or she cannot feel her toes at all. I could probably cut off a toe and she wouldn't feel it. So where the reflexes or which reflexes are abnormal will tell us where the problem is in the spinal cord the degree of paresis or paralysis and whether or not they can feel their toes tells us how bad the problem is. So in this pet, the fact that we have shift Sherrington posture and our reflexes are intact in the back legs tells us that we have a T3 to L3 spinal cord problem. And the fact that she's totally paralyzed and she cannot feel her toes tells us that it's a very severe lesion. So we like to check anal tone and make sure some little tickling or a very light pinch, they'll have a good pucker of the anus. Um, and you can check both sides to make sure it's not asymmetrical. And if you're ever worried that it doesn't seem like there's good enough robust pucker response, you can also do a digital rectal exam, uh, and that'll tell you if there's a good strong pucker around your finger or if that anal tone is indeed reduced. Cutaneous trunky is our skin reflex, so we'll start just in front of the hips. It's not expected to be present behind that. And if it's intact caudally, it's going to be intact all the way up in most cases. If it's absent caudally, then you're gonna slowly work your way up to the point to where you get that reflex back again. And the, the level in between where you don't have a reflex and where you do have a reflex is very close to where there's a problem in the spinal cord. And so we'll use that to help us further narrow down a lesion in the T3 to L3 spinal cord. So then we finally have a good feel of the whole body. We want to make sure there's no asymmetry, no pain, no masses or big lymph nodes or anything remarkable to further give us clues as to what's going on. And when I do palpation, I like to be very systematic. My hands are kind of titrated, uh, I kind of have it so that I have the same pressure that I apply to every single patient that I see. So I know that that calibration tells me most pets should tolerate it just fine. But uh, if a, a pet is reacting to me applying that same pressure, then they might truly have pain, especially if it's repeatable in a very focal area. So what we'll do when we're doing this palpation and range of motion is I'll usually start at the back end just by lifting the tail and moving it side to side. And then I'll slowly move up the spine over the top, over those dorsal spinous processes with that firm pressure. Again, not too hard, because if you push hard enough, any animal will be painful. And when I work my way up to the neck, now I'm going to move to the sides of the neck or those transverse processes. And then over the back of the head and then the front of the head. And then I might lift and then move the head from side to side. There should be little to no resistance to this range of motion. And I tend not to ventroflex animals, especially if they're small breeds, in case they have atlantoaxial disease. So when we think about pain sensation terms, we think about hyperesthesia. So this is the feeling, just feeling painful in general, or that sensation of being uncomfortable. So when we talk about a dog who has back pain, that pet has hyperesthesia over the back. And that is compared to nociception, which is the ability to feel a painful sensation. 
So this is the case where a dog might have an intact behavioral response to a toe pinch, which tells us that they have intact nociception compared to that little lab mix we saw who had absent nociception or absent deep pain with a very hard hemostat pinch. So when we do our exam, we're always trying to look for abnormalities, and then we put all those abnormalities together into a list, and we use that list to try and help us localize the lesion or tell us where the problem is coming from in the nervous system. So that is a topic for another day, um, but this concludes the discussion of how to perform the neurologic exam. If you have big questions, feel free to reach out to me. My current email address is thekrupka at illinois.edu. Thank you.